Hey, Millionaire University listeners, this is Kirsten, and I want to share something that's been a game changer in my journey from content creator to business owner, and that is Kajabi. When I started out, I knew I wanted to make serious money online, but I wasn't sure where to begin. And that's when I found Kajabi, one of the very first platforms I used. With Kajabi, I was able to host my very first courses and make tens of thousands of dollars. Kajabi is an all-in-one platform that makes building your business online a breeze. Whether you're creating stunning sales pages, setting up funnels, or hosting courses and memberships, Kajabi has you covered. It simplifies the entire process, letting you focus on what you do best, creating amazing content, and connecting with your audience and your customers. What truly sets Kajabi apart is how intuitive and user-friendly it is. I didn't have to worry about the technical stuff, which freed up my time to really grow my business and engage with my customers. If you're serious about turning your passion into a profitable business, Kajabi is one of the most important tools that you can have in your tool belt. Right now, Kajabi is offering a free 30-day trial to start your business if you go to kajabi.com slash MU. That's K-A-J-A-B-I dot com slash M-U. Go to kajabi.com slash M-U and join the creators and entrepreneurs who have made over $7 billion. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So, Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to Millionaire University. It's Eric Fisher. I'm joined this week by Jeff Trapp of the Tax Planning Pros. We're going to cover some of the essentials. We're going to dig into some of the things you need to be doing right now to make sure you're not screwing up next year's taxes. Some of the ways you can maximize your write-offs, maintain some meticulous records to make sure you avoid the IRS scrutiny, what to do if you're audited, and one of the biggest deductions that most people are not taking. We also talk about investing, how to prep your taxes if you're selling your business. And if you dread your taxes when it comes to your business, this is a great prep class with Jeff. We want to especially thank Jeff and the rest of our sponsors for supporting the show. Make sure to go to millionaireuniversity.com slash sponsors to find all their special offers for you and your business and help support this show as well. All right, let's get right on into it. Raise your hands. It's time for Jeff Trap. Jeff Trapp, welcome to Millionaire University. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's uh, an honor to be here, and uh, I'm excited to uh, help your listeners out. I want to start real quick by saying you, like the rest of us, have a have a general context where even though you founded Tax Planning Pros, that was not something you liked doing. That's like most of us. So what was that journey, that transition? Like, how did that happen? You went from hating it to doing this. I grew up in a household where my uh, stepdad was a uh, tax attorney and CPA. So I've actually been preparing taxes since I was about 14, 15 years old. And so it wasn't something I loved to do. It was more something that I had to do so I could pay for gas for my car or pay for my auto insurance or, or, you know, go out with my friends. And then I always saw my, my stepdad, you know, working those long, crazy hours during tax season. And, you know, missing my games and things like that. And I was like, well, I, I'm never going to do that because, you know, I don't want to miss my kids games. And so, you know, when I actually graduated college, I went into to sales and I decided to do that. Well, you know, working off commission was, you know, really, really stressful. It wasn't a steady paycheck like accounting. And so uh, I decided to go back and get my accounting credentials and get started in, in the tax business and uh, start out in public accounting, uh, working for some uh, regional firms out in Southern California. Wow. So it went from something that you disliked, but did begrudgingly, so to speak, but in a way, proactively, you were learning work ethic from your father and even from experience, like, or, or from example as well, seeing what he was doing and how he was, I, I don't want to use the word grinding it, but I guess kind of, he was hustling at certain points and other points, obviously it's lower, but you saw that and were like, oh, I don't know if that's for me, but then you had those skills and you had that, I, don't, I almost want to say entrepreneurial drive built into you naturally through the skill set, and then added sales onto it and said, mm, I don't know about that either. So Exactly. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm doing more sales than 
tax prep now. We've got a staff of folks that do the tax prep, but it's really focused on that uh, high level tax planning and bringing value to people. Now, having started at such a young age, how do you feel those early experiences shaped the way that you approach that today? Well, you prepare a lot of tax returns and you see that a lot of folks are, are paying a lot of money in taxes. And, and you kind of think about, you know, there's there's got to be a, a better way. There's got to be a different way to do this. And every job that I had, every experience that I had, I tried to take uh, the good things out of those positions as I began kind of this entrepreneurial journey and leave out the bad things. So everything was a learning experience. Uh, whether we failed at things, we learned. If we uh, were successful at things, well, what do we learn so we can replicate that? And, you know, just being around that and, and also working with entrepreneurs and seeing what they were doing with their taxes and finances, uh, we really wanted to, to find a better way to um, help them keep more of their hard-earned money and uh, create cash flow to live out their dreams. In, in a sense, you had this specialized experience of being able to peek into some of the most secret stuff that people hold dear when it comes to this, you know, when it comes to their business, you learn from their experience in a sense and, and kind of set yourself up that way. And, you know, most tax professionals, they're focusing primarily on preparation, but you have moved to more of that proactive stance and guidance and planning. What's the difference between those two? Some people won't know that, but what, like, what's the difference between that in your perspective? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times people think of accountants is, you know, in getting your taxes done is something that you do in the spring every year, you drop off your digital shoe box or a shoe box of receipts and give it to your accountant. And then they prepare a tax return out of kind of the digital financial mess you've given them. And you hope and pray that you don't owe a lot of money to the IRS. And then when you do owe a whole lot of money to the IRS, there isn't much conversation of like, okay, what do we do? Because once the year's over, there's really not a whole lot you can do. And so you have to be proactive throughout the year and plan and, you know, allocate certain monies uh, to taxes and implement certain strategies. And so that's where tax planning comes in. We really look at, you know, the 70,000 pages of tax code to break that down and determine, hey, you know, what is, what are your, your business goals? What are your life goals? What are your retirement goals? And create a plan that aligns with that to help you keep more of your hard-earned money to really create that long-term legacy for you and your family. So what are some of those things when we get to the point of, okay, the year is passed and you know, okay, the chapter's closed. You can't change anything. You can't go back in time. There's no time machine. What are some of the biggest things that come up that business owners need to be thinking about throughout the current year they're in? I mean, we're at, right now we're at, you know, we're recording this at almost the halfway mark for 2024. What are things that people could still course correct on this year? Yeah. I mean, right now is a perfect time to do tax planning. Because it's not too late in the year where you can't implement any of the strategies. And really what you see a lot of business owners is they're really focused on growth and revenue. But at the end of the day, it's not how much you make, it, it's how much you keep. And so where a lot of business owners first and foremost make their mistakes is coming, keeping track of those income and those expenses that they have in their business. Um, really the numbers are the lifeblood of your business. And so, you know, a lot of folks don't have enough cash flow at the end of the year to pay their tax bill. But if they're proactively planning and really viewing those financial statements, I would say on a weekly and a monthly basis, but also sitting down with their accountant on a, a monthly basis or a quarterly basis to review those numbers, then that's where the magic happens because you can say, okay, we can invest in hiring somebody. Okay, we can invest in this piece of equipment and with this piece of equipment, we can, you know, depreciate that with accelerated depreciation and get tax write-offs and pay, you know, less to the government and have more money to invest back into our business or our personal life. And so it's really, really important to know those numbers and to hire the right strategists to help you interpret those numbers. So it's, it's really a matter of, of, of awareness. And I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of other things too. You're helping everybody, a lot of business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs. What are some of the other things that they can do to maybe course correct? They're listening right now. It's, it's June ish in the middle of the year, basically. 
what other things would you tell them? It's not too late to dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And, you know, I think part of our business is like, we're really more of an educational company. We're, we're trying to help educate you so that you can do things the proper way. So if you're a business owner or if you're just starting, you know, out of business, you know, make sure you get a business bank account and don't commingle your business and personal expenses. Uh, because the IRS, if they audit you and see things that are commingled, uh, they have the right to disallow those expenses. So just keep those expenses separate. Now, if you're a sole proprietor, you can go out and get a business checking account today and your social security number. Uh, you can also get an EIN and, and get a business checking account. Or if you have a C corporation, S corporation partnership, uh, you can just take down those articles of organization to the bank and get a business bank account today. It's super, super easy, but that allows you to keep track of uh, your, your expenses. And so I would say, you know, that's kind of the first foundational thing that you want to do. Now, if you have a, a side hustle, you have a business. Also, what I would like you to do is set up an LLC, right? Uh, setting up an LLC opens so many doors for you. It protects you legally. But from a tax perspective, when that business becomes profitable, we can elect at some point, we can do that, you know, basically past, present or for future reference uh, to have that taxed as an S corporation. Uh, so you're not subject to self-employment taxes. We can have that tax C corporation. So instead of paying, you know, 37% in taxes, you can pay 21% in taxes. We can have that taxed as a partnership uh, if you're doing business with multiple people. So it really offers a ton of flexibility. So even if you're making zero today, if you go set up that LLC and you may file that your first year as a sole proprietor and your individual taxes, down the road when that business becomes profitable, it allows us that flexibility to maneuver to help you save you money on taxes. Okay. And you just mentioned a bunch of different things like LLC, S Corp. I think you may have mentioned C Corp. There might've been another one in there too. For, for the layman here, what is the difference between, let's just run through them real quick so people understand like the acronyms and, and what those different kind of options mean. Yeah. So a C Corporation is typically, I would say best for, for businesses uh, doing over $10 million in revenue. Obviously, we're going to analyze that and determine if that's the right fit with, for you uh, just because of their state tax implications and things we have to be aware of. But C corporations are, are really, really special in the fact that they, they are taxed at a lower tax rate. So they're taxed at 21%, whereas a lot of folks are in much, much higher tax brackets. And so if you can shift business income uh, to a C corporation, uh, there's some really, really great advantages there. Now there are disadvantages too, right? Uh, because the only way you can get money out of a C corporation really is through uh, paying yourself a salary, which is subject to payroll taxes and, and funding social security and Medicare and, you know, taking dividends. Well, those dividends are double tax. So you don't want to do that. And then there's different things that we can do by taking loans out of the C corporation. But that's uh, that is a very, um, I guess, robust strategy that, you know, you'd want to talk to a tax strategist about to make sure that you implement properly. Now, when it comes to an S corporation, and I would say most of your small business owners making under $10 million are going to be S corporations. And the reason they do that is because you can mitigate a lot of the self-employment tax that you would pay as a sole proprietor. And self-employment tax is 15.3%. That's an additional tax that you pay on the first $168,000 that you earn in your business. We just want to make sure uh, with the S corporation, the IRS still wants that self-employment tax money, but you do that through paying yourself a wage and you make that wage typically smaller based upon whatever kind of the fair market wage is for your position in the company. And then lastly, you, you have a partnership and typically we don't recommend having a partnership unless you're, you know, holding, you know, real estate and some other things and you have other business investors. And so that gets a little bit more complex. Gotcha. And LLC obviously is this limited liability. That one's usually one that people start off with. That's like kind of the, the base level. Um, and some people don't even do that, unfortunately. That, I mean, if somebody out there hasn't done that yet, they probably should if they're not any of the things just yet. Yeah, 100%. You know, setting up that LLC gives you the flexibility to move into the C corporation, S corporation partnership level 
when your business meets the criteria where it's advantageous to do so. And typically I would say when you're profitable, that's when, you know, we need to think about moving to a different entity structure. Again, these all have different pros and cons and, and there is no silver, but and there's no way you could say to me right now, uh, to a listener, here's what you should do because you don't know their particular situation, but they do, or they can get help in that way for their, whatever their context is, but they need to, but overall your lesson here is you need to be thinking about this and you need to be considering what's appropriate. So as a business to business marketer, you know that your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles can be painfully long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empowers marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allows you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. You'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. There's a billion members, 180 million of which are senior level executives and 10 million are C-level executives. You'll be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. In technology, LinkedIn generated 2 to 5x higher return on ad spend than other social media platforms, and 79% of B2B content marketers said LinkedIn produces the best results for paid media. So if you're ready to work with a partner who respects the B2B world you operate in, then you need LinkedIn ads. So make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mupod to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash mupod. Terms and conditions apply. You know that's the sound of another sale on your online Shopify store. But did you know Shopify powers selling in person too? With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone. Transform your tablet into a point of sale system or Use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Take customers from picking it out to picking it up. Shopify syncs in-store inventory with Google, so when local customers search for that thing they want that you have, bam, you're there. Demand meets supply. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash MU, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com dot com slash mu to take your retail business to the next level today shopify.com slash mu what else should businesses or business owners entrepreneurs be thinking about let's go back to documentation what are some of the best practices that you've got in terms of documentation because they may it's not too late for them to catch up this year and then remain on track for the remainder of the year yeah 100 percent. i mean you should definitely set up a, a quickbooks online account to keep track of your income and your expenses. It's fairly easy to operate, uh, especially if you only have one or two accounts uh, because you can automate that where it pulls in your income and expenses from your bank account and then you just have to categorize them. And, you know, they have some sort of AI feature where they actually, you know, once they kind of get to know your spending habits and where you like to go, uh, you can program it to categorize those expenses for you. And I would say if you're a business owner making, you know, two under two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you can probably set that up and operate that on your own. Uh, if you're making over two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you probably it's going to get more complex, and you probably want to hire uh, an accountant or a uh, fractional CFO to to come in and and reconcile those accounts and help you understand the numbers and and what's going on uh, in your business. But I would say that that's definitely uh, the first thing that you should do. That can be one of those things where it's like, I, I'm not good at keeping records. I can, you know, that's where you, you have to then bite the bullet and say, okay, I've got to get somebody who can help. I think that's something that we often, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, they find they are mm, a little lax or a, a little hesitant to ask for help or hire for help, especially if they don't know that they have the funds yet. Yeah. And I think a lot of business owners have the misconception that an accountant, a tax strategist is a cost. And really, you need to look at it as an investment. If you're investing in a, a good accountant or a good tax strategist, they're going to find you probably anywhere from three to 10 times more than you would invest uh, to work with them. And business owners are an expert in their business and what they sell. They're not a, an expert in accounting. Right. And that's why you hire 
these specialists to to help you out uh, so you can focus on growing uh, your business. And, and that's a lot of times what we see. Once our business owners finally turn over the accounts, let us do our magic, their businesses grow because it's one less thing that they have to worry about on a monthly basis. Well, speaking of investments, I know that's something else that you talk a lot about when it comes to using those or utilizing those effectively for tax savings. For somebody who hasn't yet entered into that world, how would you start to coach them when they come in and say, hey, I've heard about this thing called investment. I haven't started yet. Where should I start? It's, it's a, such a wide open question. What are those first couple steps look like? Yeah, we really want to sit down with them and determine, you know, what are your retirement goals? You know, how much do you want to have in retirement? How much do you currently set aside? A lot of times what we see is, you know, one spouse is the business owner. The other spouse has a W-2 where they might have a 401k. So they already have something uh, set aside. And really what we want to, to preach is, hey, we want you to hit your goals. What are the best avenues to do that? And so we talk a lot about diversification, but some really, really great investments from a tax perspective, right? To get those write-offs on your tax return are real estate. And, you know, I, I love real estate because, you know, you can create cash flow, you can create appreciation and equity if you, you hold the, the real estate long-term, but there's so many great write-offs uh, with real estate. You get to write off, you know, everything. You get to write off your real estate taxes, your HOA dues, homeowners insurance, and then depreciation. And there are some fantastic strategies around depreciation, most notably something called cost segregation, where we can accelerate the depreciation and get you additional write-offs, additional cash flow to go out and invest that next property and build that real estate portfolio. People hear the word depreciation and they start to think of that whole, well, as soon as you drive the car off the lot, it starts to go down in value. But you're talking about depreciation in a positive light. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. So in life, there are a bunch of different assets that you can put your money into. And buying a car is an asset that doesn't appreciate unless you're buying, you know, probably a luxury car or one of those classic you know, Corvettes or, you know, Mustangs, right? You know, if you're just going to buy a Honda Accord or a, a Ford Taurus or, you know, whatever is out there, you're going to lose 20% of the value of what you pay as soon as you drive it off the lot. Whereas when you buy a real estate, real estate appreciates every single year. You know, it might only appreciate 1% one year, but as you saw during, you know, COVID, uh, real estate appreciated 25, 50, you know, a hundred percent in some areas of the country. Now there's been a little bit of a pullback, but everybody is still ahead if you bought a home prior to COVID. And the same goes true if you have a real estate portfolio. And so the cool thing about that is if you have a home that you purchased for $300,000 as an investment property, and it's a single family residence, you can depreciate the, that 300,000 and I'm not accounting for land just because, you know, that's a, another calculation, but you can depreciate that over 27 and a half years. Well, with a cost segregation engineering study, you can actually break out the components in the property uh, that are considered land improvements or more home improvements uh, that can be depreciated over five, seven and 15 years. So it's, you know, you like your light fixtures, your bathroom fixtures, things that need to be replaced more quickly than 27 and a half years. And that qualifies for bonus depreciation. So you get write-offs almost immediately. And the thing that I love about cost segregation, if you've never heard about this type of thing, is you can actually go back and cost segregate something that you may have placed in service or acquired in 2020. Uh, you, you, you don't have to put that in service or acquire in 2024. So you may just be hearing about this for the first time. And we partner with great companies that uh, give us great deals. And uh, one of the companies we partner with, one of the guys wrote the code with the IRS on cost segregation. So they typically get anywhere from 10 to 30% more in deductions than some of the cost segregation companies that you see out there on the market. So it's really, really cool. Wow. So knowing some of these secrets can really change the the balance of the scales. 100%. And so that's the cool thing is, you know, we just 
brought on a client uh, this year and she had never heard about this, but she owns 13 rental properties that she's acquired over the last three, four years. We haven't filed the 2023 taxes. So we're going to go in and, and do cost segregation studies on all these properties. And it's probably going to save her about 150 grand in taxes in this year alone. That's amazing. That's, that's, you know, for somebody listening right now, they're like, Oh, how can you do that for me? I mean, it's going to maybe be different. So let's talk about maybe what's some of the, what are some of the other types of investments that have similar options like this? Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of great investments uh, out there. It really just depends what your, your cup of tea is. So, you know, with real estate, you know, you have to meet certain hours requirements and participation requirements and not, not everybody qualifies. So um, another kind of tip surrounding real estate is if you don't qualify for those specific hours requirements uh, and, you know, you have basically another job where you're not a full-time real estate professional is what they call it. Uh, there's also a short-term real estate strategy and they call this the Airbnb strategy. And what the Airbnb strategy is you can invest in real estate. And as long as the rental days are under, uh, on average, under seven days, uh, you can still take advantage and report the losses from cost segregation and offset your W-2 income, your business income, things like that. So that's a really uh, neat strategy uh, that I like. And then, you know, as far as other high level strategies, uh, they, you can invest in energy uh, and solar. Our, our government is really big into clean energy right now. So you can invest into uh, solar farms and get tax write-offs and also get a return on your investment uh, every single year. There are uh, different film and in tax credits that you can uh, invest in. So if you invest in the production uh, of a movie, uh, you can get tax credits for movies that are, you know, made in, you know, Georgia, New Mexico, New York. They have all these different film and tax credits that pass off to you as uh, the investor. And if the movie does great, you get to share in the profits. Uh, if it doesn't, you, you still get the tax write-offs because of the state tax credit. Um, you know, there's uh, different equipment uh, leasing programs that are really great for high income earners where you invest in equipment that you get to write off through depreciation and section 179 expense to lower your tax bill, but you also get an 18% return on your investment for every single year. So uh, it's really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, creates a lot of opportunities uh, if you have the uh, capital to invest in these things. Now, say somebody's hearing this and they're thinking, "Ooh, I'm interested," but they want to make sure they do their due diligence. You know, really analyze the potential risks and rewards. What would be the decision making rubric that you would present to them in terms of making sure they do it the right way? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question, and I highly, highly recommend that you do diligent do do diligence on any of these programs or things uh, that we recommend. And so, when you come on as a client with us, you know we'll present uh, the best strategies that would work for you. And if your income meets the criteria to invest in these sort of things, then you know we sit down with the, the folks that that run these programs. You know, we invite you to bring in you know your attorneys, your financial planners so that we all can make an educated uh, decision. I'm light years ahead of the curve here because I've spent the last several years doing the due diligence and making sure we're, we're aligned with the right partners and making sure, hey, is, is this strategy going to get audited? And hey, if it does get audited, you know, what are, what are our chances of winning? And what does that look like? And so, you know, I feel very, very confident in the strategies that we present to our clients. And I'm not somebody that's going to just like, if I hear something, I'm not going to just rush it out to the market and out to my clients. I'm very, very conservative in who we align with and, and what we do. There's some other people out there, they're listening. They're like, okay, I'm, I've already got investments. I've already, I've already got my correct legal entity, although I may take a quick peek and see if I can change it up. And if that gives me better opportunity. But I think there's always people who are looking for those common overlooked business expenses that can be used to significantly reduce their business's taxable income. You know, give us some examples of some of the things people just don't consider that are overlooked. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite strategies is, I mean, I've got five kids, five boys, and, you know, I want to create that same work ethic that I have. So I hire them in my business. 
Well, your children ages seven to 17 in 2024, you can pay them up to $14,600 tax-free to work in your business. Now, you've probably heard about this on, you know, TikTok or social media, and there's certain criteria and things and steps you need to take to implement this, depending on what legal entity structure you are. So you avoid uh, paying uh, certain taxes. And you also have to, you know, look out for certain state tax laws when it comes to hiring your kids. But I love to hire the kids because you get the money out of the business, the tax free, and then you can use that money to their earning income. You can invest that into a Roth IRA. With our kids, we uh, have it invested into a uh, life insurance policy. By the time they retire, they're going to be millionaires. They don't even know this yet uh, for the work that they're doing. And then, you know, you can use that to pay for, you know, extracurricular activities uh, such as, you know, football, dance, you know, or you can start putting that money aside for them into, you know, a 529 plan for college savings. So there's a lot of things that you can do there to increase the wealth and and the net worth uh, of the family uh, just by hiring the kids uh, into your business. More and more entrepreneurs and investors are discovering the awesome franchise opportunities that exist across a variety of industries. Franchising can simply be the better path and interest in franchising is at an all time high. Lucky for you, John Austinson, founder of Fran Bridge Consulting and a past Millionaire University guest, is here to help you explore the premier franchise opportunities today. John and his Frambridge Consulting team are part of the largest franchise brokerage in the U.S. and have vetted the market thoroughly. Frambridge is hands down the premier source for the best opportunities in the franchise world, including both active and passive opportunities. From tiny homes to youth soccer to industrial hoses to pets, senior care to mental health and more. John has served as an Inc. 500 franchisor and is a multi-brand franchisee himself. And he does more placements than anyone else in the country. Sign up for a free consultation call with John today or get a free copy of his book, Non-Food Franchising, at franbridgeconsulting.com. That's franbridgeconsulting.com. Available in the U.S. and Canada. Oftentimes, hiring the kids means you're also working out of a home, potentially. And I know that some people see that home office deduction as maybe a red flag. Can you clarify some of the confusion around that? I review tax returns every day and I would say 90% of them don't take the the home office deduction. And so I always ask the question, well, why aren't you taking a home office deduction? And they're like, well, my CPA says it's a red flag. I'm going to get audited. And, you know, I'm scared of the IRS. And we live in a world that is really based upon telecommuting and in working from home. Uh, especially after COVID. And so, you know, you have about a 3.1% chance of being audited if you don't take the home office deduction. Now, the crazy thing is that goes up to a whopping 3.2% if you do take the home office deduction. So why wouldn't you take that deduction if you're legally entitled to and you do have a home office? So, you know, the misconceptions that we see surrounding that is a lot of people feel like, well, I don't have a dedicated room for a home office. IRS says, I need a dedicated room. Well, actually the code section says you need a dedicated space. So even if you're working out of your kitchen, you could set up a workspace with a desk and a filing cabinet and printer. And, you know, as long as you are doing your work there and not at the kitchen table, you can deduct uh, that space. And, you know, what the cool thing is, is you get to deduct a, a percentage of your your, your whole mortgage interest, your property taxes, your HOA dues, your homeowner's insurance. And if you do have a dedicated home office and you wanted to go in and remodel that and make improvements, that is what they call a direct expense. So you get to write off that, that expense 100%. So you're seeing a lot of people nowadays, you know, put in podcast studios in their, their home office and maybe that costs 10, 12, 15 grand and they get a 100% uh, write off on that uh, because it's fully dedicated uh, to uh, the office. It can be a lot of work up front, but it's then you've already got, I mean, you've got measurements, you've got things set up. So then you're like, it's a template now. In other words, that's the thing I want to drive home for people. It's do the homework. And then you have that template set up for future use. 100%. And, 
you know, the, the, the cool thing is, you know, we've been able to optimize things. So when you're trying to take advantage of a strategy, you know, we have those templates and, and, and those guidelines and, and things for you to use. Uh, so you don't have to worry uh, about the IRS if they do come knocking on your door. You're, you've got all the documentation you need. And so all of a sudden the IRS doesn't become that scary to you. Yeah, because I think that's the thing is that a lot of people make poor decisions because of fear based on fear versus facts. Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, the, the IRS, uh, you know, is in that process of hiring those 87,000 revenue agents right now. Right. And they probably hired about 14,000. Well, they did a study recently and, you know, they're supposed to predominantly audit taxpayers over making making over a million dollars. Well, 80 percent of those new audits over the last two years have been on taxpayer make payers making under a million dollars. And the reason for that is a taxpayer under a million dollars is going to be scared. They're not going to fight it. They're just going to write the check. So it's an easy win for the IRS versus if somebody or a company is making over a million bucks, hey, they have the money to hire, you know, someone like ourselves or a tax attorney to fight them. And they don't want to go through, they want easy wins. They want easy money. And so that's why taxpayers under a million bucks are being targeted. See, and you saying that makes me think a lot of people are listening like, oh, well, now I'm more scared, not less. I mean, obviously, other than working with someone that's a trusted professional, what are some of the ways that they can do to avoid that scenario happening? Yeah, I would say take every tax deduction that you're legally entitled to. So, you know, if you actually have a, a business expense, uh, you know, like a, a business travel or, you know, seminar that you're going to, you know, pay for that out of your business. That's easy to explain away. So some kind of tips and tricks, uh, you know, you don't need to be scared of the IRS. Now, I would say if you ever do get audited by the IRS, you want to hire a professional to go and represent you. But you want to keep your tax returns for at least four years and you want to keep your receipts for four years. And a lot of people, when they first on board with us, they're like, well, Jeff, I've got my credit card statements. I've got my bank statements. I'm fine. Well, in the tax code, it says you must show us receipts when, you know, if you get audited and, and keep those receipts or we can disallow all of your deductions, which is a scary thought, right? So I, I've been to, to many audits and they're not going to disallow all the expenses, but I've seen them disallow like half the expenses because they want to get paid for the work that they've done. You know, they... They feel like they won the lotto when they've pulled you and you don't have your receipts. So if you keep your documentation, honestly, you have nothing to worry about. And when we go down to these tax audits at the IRS office, I literally take a really thick notebook. It's probably six inches thick. And we go through each receipt one by one. And, you know, they either put you in in the morning from eight to 12, well, they want to leave right at 12 to hit lunchtime, they're government employees, or they put you in from one to five, they want to go home right at five. So, you know, you, you kind of sit down there at the IRS office, you go through some expenses, and then you, you notice like, oh, hey, you like the LA Lakers or the LA Dodgers, and you start talking about that, oh, you've got five kids, what sports do they play? And time starts to fly, and then all of a sudden, you know, that adjustment that they make is very small or they don't make it at all because they're so overwhelmed and you guys have been talking about other things and it's time to move on to, to the next audit. So that's the importance of hiring a professional that knows what they're doing. Because mainly they can see that things are in order there. They're not like, in other words, there aren't any obvious red flags poking out of the, you know, they're looking for needles and they're looking for lots of needles and haystack and instead they're, they're not finding anything. So they're just, they're like, OK, well, we're spending time here. And like you said, those kind of deadlines of mid, you know, of, of afternoon and end of day kind of come quickly as you get chatting. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I find that very funny. One of the other things I think that people think about is they're they're operating a business that is in multiple states. So how does that come into play? Yeah, that's really, really tricky, right? Because you have different what they call nexus and nexus means, you know, what are you doing in those states? Do you have payroll in those states? Do you have employees there? Are you renting office space in those states? And are you creating sales in those states? And every state is different and they have their own criteria. And so you'll have to analyze what, what those laws are and determine if you owe taxes to those states. Now, if you have 
employees in those states, you're, you're definitely going to have to pay payroll taxes and most likely file a tax return in those states. If you are renting office space there or creating income, uh, you st probably still have some of those issues. And then on top of that, uh, depending on what type of business it is, you know, if you're an e-commerce business, you need to worry about uh, sales tax. Um, there's certain, um, you know, service businesses like, you know, lawn care and landscaping and pest control that you have to pay sales tax on. So there's very few businesses that aren't subject to sales tax as well as income tax when they're working in multiple states. But again, a trusted professional can walk you through all of that. And something that, I mean, we, I, and I've had, you know, a client that I've worked with where they've some of, you know, they have a salesman now suddenly in Utah. And because of that stuff suddenly changes, even though they're based in Ohio. So it's like, okay, have to figure all that out. And, and some of that changes when, I mean, if you have an online business, they kind of think, well, I'm sending it out everywhere and that's fine. But there are, there, there are certain like thresholds or certain lines in the sand that once you cross them and if you're unaware of them, you kind of trip things up. So, yeah, I mean, California is one of those really greedy states, right? So wherever the person is who makes the purchase online, that's where the sales tax has to go. So those are some things that you have to be aware of and make sure you withhold that money and mail in those checks or, uh, you're going to get into a lot, a lot of trouble. Well, speaking of that, sometimes these laws are constantly changing. What are your recommendations for business owners to stay informed and stay on top of things? Yeah, I mean, it, it gets really, really tricky. So if you don't want to follow the 24 hour news cycle on tax, I would highly recommend that you hire a, a tax professional. You know, we're, we subscribe to all of the latest and, and greatest uh, things and, you know, those subscriptions cost us tens of thousands of dollars every single year to make sure that we're on top of all the various law changes. I mean, right now we're in an election year. So uh, President Biden has released his tax proposal. Well, there's a lot to unpack there and he doesn't want to lower taxes. He wants to, to raise taxes. And for our real estate investors clients, it's really scary because they want to raise the capital gains tax rates. Well, that affects you if you're selling real estate or if you have a lot of stocks, but they also want to lower the thresholds on 1031 exchanges right now on 1031 exchanges, like kind exchanges, which really keeps the investor market going. Uh, they want to make a, a limit on that, that if you sell property with a $500,000 gain or more that you pay taxes right away, instead of reinvesting that back into, you know, more real estate. So there's some really, really tricky things going on there. And, you know, it's important to align yourself with people that know the tax laws and how that's going to uh, impact your taxes uh, going forward. One other aspect I think that a lot of business owners are thinking about is the whole idea of you build a business, you build a business, you build it up and grow and grow and grow. And then comes that cash out time where you're going to sell it and hand it off to somebody else. And then they don't think of, oh, how does that affect my tax liability for that sale? What are some of the ways that people who either have started multiple or have grown multiple and are considering selling them or, or working towards that goal of selling it, what should they be doing now on their way to that point? If you're looking to sell a business in the next three to five years, the time to plan is now. And Really, what you want to look at is getting kind of the bluff, I would say, out of the business to show maximum profitability. Now, with maximum profitability comes more taxes. So we have to come up with strategies on the personal side to mitigate those taxes. But if you want high value, so right now, really the big thing that we're seeing, and it's affecting a lot of our clients in a positive way is private equity is coming in and purchasing a lot of service-based businesses. So if you're in landscaping, pest control, pool uh, cleaning or services, we just had a veterinary clinic that sold. And, you know, they were facing a, a tax of about $2 million on the exit. And we were able to help them with proper planning and aligning with the proper partners to save about $1.8 million of that tax. And so, you know, it's important that you strategize because a lot of times people don't think about these things uh, and they don't consult the right people and they'll go out and sell a highly appreciated asset like 
business or sell real estate. And once those things are sold, there's not a ton you can do. But if you plan prior to that, then you can really, really maximize your tax savings. And, you know, if you're looking to sell something like highly appreciated real estate or a highly appreciated asset or a highly appreciated business, you're, you're going to do so within the next 30 days, then you really, really need to talk to somebody. And, and especially if you're selling something that is, you know, maybe at eight, 10, 12, 15 million dollars, you know, you're going to have a inheritance tax implications. And, you know, that's something that can be avoided with the, the proper structures. Well, Jeff, you've given so much for us to one, act on, two, think about, and three, plan for, but you aren't done yet. You continually are sharing your knowledge and wisdom on your podcast. And I'd love for you to let us know where people can go to check that out as well as, and you also have a playbook that's available. You can find us at uh, the Jeff Trap podcast or on Apple, Spotify, all the major podcast uh, players. I do a weekly either tax, financial, economic tip. We talk about business and anywhere from five to about 12 minutes every week just to kind of keep you updated on what's going on out there in the world. Uh, You know, we're coming up on our two year anniversary. So a lot of the things that I've spoken on on that podcast can apply to you today. And then we're also going to give away a free tax playbook at mytaxplaybook.com. And they're going to go ahead and post that in the show notes so you guys can get access uh, to that with some of our our, our top favorite tax strategies that you can implement today. Uh, If you like what you hear today, you can go to our website at thetaxplanningpros.com and and schedule a uh, complimentary tax consultation to, you know, see if what's going on with your your life and your business. And also make sure that uh, you're not overpaying in taxes because you know what? I don't think the government spends your money that you've worked so hard for better than you do. And if you think that they do, then you're probably not a great fit for us. That's a great qualifier. I love hearing that. So Jeff, thank you so much. You have shared so much and we are very grateful for you being here. Thanks for giving us your time and your experience and your expertise. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been a blast today and uh, best of luck. There you go. Proactive tax planning and financial strategy with Jeff Trapp. Remember, it's not just about earning money, but it's about keeping it and not giving it away when you honestly don't have to. Don't forget that all the resources we talked about in this conversation that Jeff mentioned, they are listed in the show notes. You can start by digging in deeper with them and that it's contextual. Everybody's business is different. So, so are your taxes. And that means start planning today. And it also means that if you liked this episode, you should share it with somebody that you know needs to hear it. I know you know of somebody. Text them, share it on social, email them. You know the best way to get a hold of them. Hit that share button wherever you're listening to this. Send it on over to them. And don't miss upcoming future amazing episodes. Subscribe or follow wherever you are right now. And make sure you go to millionaireuniversity.com slash training to get your free business course for extended learning. Thanks again for sharing. Thanks for listening. And until next episode, class dismissed. Dismissed.